sure everything's up and running properly, and then we'll get started with the Battle of Malvern Hill. So if you guys happen to find yourself into the chat and you can hear my voice, please go ahead and let me know that you can hear me. I'm just checking to make sure everything's working properly. So if you guys happen to find yourself... Oh, mm -hmm. I guess it is because I just heard myself coming through the other computer. I'm going to go ahead and get some things updated and we'll give it about five minutes and then we'll go ahead and get started. Hey, hey, Aiden's Puppet Productions, John Carson, and Taylor, awesome, glad to have you guys here. So we're going to get started here fairly soon. Guten Tag. So we're once again uh, streaming both on YouTube and also on Twitch. So take your pick. And, and I have the chat combined so I can see everybody from both at the same time. We're going to get into Malvern Hill here in just a minute. I'm going to try something unique that I've never tried before in that battle. Um, so if you have a particular strategy, if you've played this game and you have a particular strategy you use as the union, go ahead and throw it out there just for discussion purposes. Um, but I'm going to try something a little different for this one. Going to Washington, D.C. on Monday. Very cool. What are you going, uh, anything in particular going to see while you're there? Forward Twitch is uh, actually real similar to this. Uh, it's just instead of being... Um, dedicated to different kinds of channels. Twitch is just really a, a, a gaming streaming service where you can watch people playing games. Uh, and a lot of people prefer it to YouTube. Um, I myself do not, but I know a lot of people do, so I want to try and make myself available on both if I can. Steven, glad you didn't fall asleep today, buddy. Glad you're here. Washington Zoo. I have not been there since I was in 8th grade and we took our trip to Washington, D.C. That was the last time I was at the zoo. Uh, more often than not, when I go to D.C., I, I go to the National Archives and not really anything else. So I uh, just go there to do research, and I've seen pretty much everything else multiple times. So, uh, But it's definitely a trip worth taking, and I'm lucky enough that I live about five hours away from there. So, uh, Vilkas, it is 6 p.m. on the East Coast in the United States, so it would be 3 out in California, 3 p.m., and uh, 4 or 5 in other parts. So it's anywhere from 3 uh, in the afternoon until 6 p.m. here in the in the U.S. right now. The Smith's Onion History Museum. I have not been to that one. Similar except it sucks, Janice says. All right, we're going to get started here in about another minute or two. Uh, I think we've already got a decent number of folks that are here, and I'm sure more will be joining us. As we go along, I will most likely, as I mentioned uh, on my video that I uploaded earlier today, most likely not be streaming next week. Now that could change, and if it does, I'll certainly let you guys know that, but um, I think we're getting our keys to our new house on Friday, so probably going to be moving next weekend. And uh, so then the next time you hear from me after that, I should be in my new digs in our new office of our new home. So pretty excited about that. But we're going to go ahead and get started here in another minute. A 
11 o'clock in Belgium. Steven, yeah, I'll touch base with you later on. Too much bling and irritating pop-ups. Uh, Aiden's puppet, I think they are referring to Twitch. Twitch is better. Uh, you, Janice, did you mean Twitch, not Twitter? Um, oh, where am I moving to? Um, I am actually only moving three miles away from where I live now. Um, it's actually the same school district that we, we already live in uh, for my kids. Um, it's just a, a different zip code. Uh, but I'm still going to be in Northeast Ohio. Uh, we're just moving into a bigger home. Uh, my full-time job and my wife's jewelry business have been good to us and given us the opportunity to move into something that actually has a little room. Uh, so my kids will each have their own bedroom finally, uh, which is not something we had before. And uh, so it'll be nice. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm just, I just got to switch back over to um, do one, th look at one thing real quick on here. There we go. All right, so it looks like we got 15 already watching on YouTube, a couple watching on Twitch. Um, oh, Taylor, that's awesome. <laughs> Aiden's Puppet, uh, Epping, New Hampshire. I've only been to New Hampshire once, and that was a couple years ago uh, for my job with Rachel's Challenge. Uh, I was actually speaking at a school in uh, Chester, Vermont, but I spent the night in New Hampshire the night before. So uh, beautiful up there in that area. Uh, Vilkis, I'm glad you enjoyed that. I... Uh, I want to do justice to the German Empire. Um, I know I'm related to probably half of Southwest Germany. So, all right, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Malvern Hill, uh, an interesting battle uh, historically. And uh, this is one we have a limited number that we can take into. And he did scale up some. So I'm only going to slightly outnumber him in this battle just by about 4,000 men. I could only put 15 brigades in each corps. Um, and before I get into this, just to kind of talk a little bit about the historic battle of Malvern Hill. Malvern Hill was the one and only time during the entire uh, seven days battles uh, outside of Richmond and the peninsula where the entire Union Army was actually present on the field. Every other battle during the seven days, because of the nature of the terrain and because of the nature of how McClellan was doing things, only parts of the Union Army engaged the Confederates. Uh, so the entire Union Army was on the field for this battle. It was dominated by Union artillery, uh, and when you play as the Confederates on this battle, uh, you see that because you face a ton of Union artillery, and they just give you nightmares in this battle. Um, Confederate infantry caused a lot of casualties, but nothing real major, and um, this was a battle where even though McClellan was present on the field, he primarily kind of ceded control of the army in this one like he had in others to Fitz John Porter, who was kind of his favorite subordinate. Um, all right, so uh, we've got several people speaking German now. I love it. I really need to brush up on my German. Um, I've said this before, but I've been taking it on uh, Duolingo, which is a really cool app to use to learn a language. Um, but with the moving and all that fun process, we really haven't done it as much as that as, as I would like. So here is my thought about what I'm going to do here, because even though I slightly outnumber him once everybody's on the field, uh, I will not for most of this battle. The way that the the reinforcements arrive for this battle, I'm, hev I'm heavily going to be outnumbered for most of the Battle of Malvern Hill. Uh, now, I could hang on to the fortifications here, hold the objective, and throw him back. I'll take a lot of casualties doing it, but I can hold there. I know that I can hold there. However, I'm going to try something a little different. And what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to cede control of that objective to him. And by doing that, what happens is I'm actually going to hasten uh, the arrival of my reinforcements. Because it's going to trigger the last stage of the battle a whole lot faster. And even though I won't have weakened him, uh, there's something to be said for holding the position, weakening him, and then coming up with a bunch of reinforcements to just completely overwhelm him. Um and probably cause more casualties in the process, but uh, doing it this way, I will suffer fewer casualties. So I'm going to still try to inflict as many on him as I can, uh, but I'm going to try to do that whilst preserving my own army as much as possible. Uh, you'll notice, too, that I have all uh, kind of one-star and even some no-star units here. What I've decided to do is have them on the front lines, let them absorb the brunt of the initial casualties, and then I'm going to rush forward at the end with my um, two-star units and kind of 
really turn the tide on this one. You learn Dutch on Duolingo. Dutch Dutch seems like it might be a tough language. I don't know. Janice lives in Dixie. Yes. I live close. I live about 40 minutes away from what was Virginia at the start of the Civil War. Um, I'm, I'm, re- I'm just about 40 minutes north of the Virginia Panhandle where I live. And uh, the, the farthest north that a, a main body of Confederate troops uh, came in uh, the Civil War actually uh, was Morgan's command, who surrendered just about 15 to 20 miles from where I live. Yeah, I, I thought Dutch was probably very similar to German when I've heard it spoken. I've always gotten that impression. So you'll see that um, this one's going to trigger, probably in the next couple of minutes here, it's going to trigger phase two. And then once he takes North Malvern Hill, it'll trigger phase three of this one. So we're going to move through this pretty fast and get right into the the next part of the campaign and hopefully get all the way up to second bull run uh, tonight in this live stream. Because second bull run's a, a pretty quick battle on the Union side if you play your cards right. Galanta, welcome back, sir. 11 p.m. there in Denmark, and then I run into Malvern Hill. Love this battle. Uh, Galan, I was just talking to them about trying something completely new this time. And you can probably already see what I've done. Um, because of the nature of this battle, how the Union's outnumbered for most of it, and you don't get most of your troops until the last phase of the battle, uh, I'm trying something new, and I'm basically ceding the objective to him right off the bat. Uh, and I'm going to let him come into open ground on the opposite side and uh, try to just inflict casualties on him that way and then just overrun him with my with my reinforcements when they arrive. I'm going to drop my 20 pounders back here a little bit. But uh, yeah, this when you try to hold this objective here, it gets ugly because this the way these trees kind of are out there, um, it just it causes problems. So I want to have a nice strong solid front battle line here. And, and catch him in the open, and I'll have a ton of artillery by the time this battle's over, and I'll really just be able to light him up. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn my flank right here. So if he so chooses and he wants to come up this hill at me, then he is more than welcome to do so. Good day from an Aussie. Just my opinion. What time is it in Australia right now? That is awesome. I have a, a friend, one of my fellow presenters. Uh, a speaker for Rachel's Challenge who just moved to Australia uh, about a month ago. I'm going to hold Loomis back and uh, just kind of watch and see what he's, he does before I uh, decide where to put him. But we're going to get all the artillery here. There's my 24 pounders. 10 pounders, 20 pounders. Let's move these. Uh... I'm going to get some of the smooth bores moved up a little bit and back up the 10 pounders just a hair. 8.40 a.m. Awesome. So maybe I've hit kind of a sweet spot time wise. It's. Uh... Not not insanely late for our friends in Europe. Uh, it's a Saturday evening for us here in the States or late afternoon. And, and then it's in the morning for Australia. So, yeah. Um, Chickamauga, 2,000 kills with an artillery battery. That's awesome. You can definitely do that with a bunch of them at Fredericksburg. Just my opinion. Yeah, I need to get back into War of Rights. I haven't played for a while. Uh, I had a lot of fun with that game uh, when I was when I played it most recently, but uh, just got into other things and just. But I definitely plan on getting back to War of Rights at some point here fairly soon. So yeah, it's already tomorrow out there in Australia. So even though artillery was a big deal for the for the Union during this battle, and I, and I think I read somewhere that something like half of the Confederate casualties at Malvern Hill were the direct result of artillery, uh, the Confederate artillery performed very poorly. Uh, even though Lee directed a couple of huge batteries um, up here on this hill, they didn't do real well. 
on a jet lag from Hawaii. That's awesome. Yeah, forward. I know that. Um, I know that I'm in the open, but so is he. And um, holding this line here, uh, it works. But first of all, the fortifications really spread you out. Uh, and then this little thing here that juts out, it just ends up being more more problems than it's worth. So. What I want to do is I want to get him in the open, and as soon as he gets close to all my artillery, um, I should be able to light him up pretty good. And plus then I'm closer to all of my reinforcements as they arrive, because I'm heavily outnumbered right now. Uh, he's got me better than 2 to 1. He's got 36,000 men to my 16,000 on the battlefield. And so the longer that I can kind of put him off, the better. So forward, what are you going to be teaching? Uh, here comes one lone brigade. Yeah, War of Rights does does uh, at the very least get yourself a good um, good uh, dedicated graphics card. That's really what made the big difference for me because I've got 16 gigabytes of RAM and uh, um, a really good processor. Uh, and uh, still had a little trouble till I got the dedicated graphics card. See, I'm going to have plenty of supplies, so I'll be able to keep my artillery hot the entire battle. And we're about to trigger the last phase now. So I, uh, I think I mentioned this before, HOI-4. Um, went to Hawaii 15, almost 16 years ago when my wife and I got married. We... Uh, we had a great time. We were there for eight nights. We had six nights on Kauai and uh, two nights in Oahu. Yeah, manning the fortifications and, and going forward. And you know, honestly, that was my other option that I considered was actually moving forward and taking him out. Um, I'm trying to remember. Uh, I think it's uh, I think his name's Agrippa Maxentius, maybe. Uh, has a video where he does that. He, um, he he moves forward and he actually ends up being able to put a battle line right here and kind of gobbles up the Union right in this area. And it worked out pretty well for him doing that. I just thought, I've played this battle several times. I wanted to try something completely different and just see what happens with it. I'm not necessarily doing this because I think it's the ideal strategy. And here comes our, la our next uh, set of reinforcements. We actually have one more set of reinforcements that will still be arriving. Now what I am going to do is I'm going to probably have some fun with these uh, with the cavalry and see if I can go try to find all his supplies. I did a playthrough on this earlier today just trying some different things and I sent my cavalry all the way around up here and when I got over here I actually ran into no, no lie six uh, supply wagons all in one spot and I grabbed all six of them. It was great. I doubt that will happen again. Yeah, forward, that's a way to go, uh, dropping a grand. I don't even have, you know what, I don't have $1,000 into my gaming PC, and I can run pretty much every game just fine. I have probably $700 into this one, not counting my monitor, which I'm actually using a TV for a monitor on this one. Gib Hacker, yeah, Earthworks cause realistic casualties. Um, they do. Uh, and you see that a lot, especially in later battles, like um, when you get into 1864, when a lot of the battles uh, on this game uh, involve fortifications, you see a lot of those really heavily one-sided casualties. All right, we're going to send these two, first two cavalry units over. I've got a few more that are still going to arrive later, and that's when I'll kind of make my ride around. All right, so he's... Uh, obliging me quite nicely so far by only assaulting with one or two brigades at a time. Just my opinion. Really appreciate that, sir. Um, I'm glad you, you enjoy what you see. World and U.S. history forward and government. Nice. That's what I actually went to college for. Um, I was a history major in college, secondary education. My, my, my goal was eventually to be a history professor. Uh, in college, life kind of took a different turn for me, and 
I have no regrets about that, but it's just kind of how things went. But this gives me a nice outlet for um, my love of history. So he's starting to come up now. I'm going to back up just a hair with these guys, but not too much. I don't want to expose Loomis's flank. All right, here come my last, last set of uh, reinforcements. I really don't need to hold this other objective, but I'll go ahead and leave a, a unit back there anyway. Yeah, after Chickamauga, you're absolutely right. There are no minor battles after Chickamauga. Every battle, even though it may be defined as a minor battle on this game, every battle is huge. So just looking at my artillery, everybody's having a nice day so far. I'm going to move these 24-pounders up just a little bit. And right now, uh, for the first time, I actually have an advantage on the battlefield. I've only lost, what, about 17, 1,600 men so far. He's lost about 3,000, but that's going to dramatically change as we go along here. And I'm going to start moving some of my units up a little quicker. And I'm also going to go ahead and start taking my cavalry around. So as time goes on in this battle, especially the last two hours, the artillery really makes a difference because he's got a lot of units that are up close. And they just really lay into him big time. You're going to see that with Lawton right here. He pursues me a little bit, but then all of my artillery is going to turn on him, and he's going to run in a hurry. And remember, I'm still using most of my inexperienced units. It's going to be that last wave that has my, my two stars in it. Yeah, um... I was just telling you about that battle, Agrippa Maxentius, when he played on, on this battle and uh, advanced real far forward. He had a unit of uh, skirmishers with those telescopic sights, and he just tore into people with those. He had something like 2,000 kills. It was really good. So here he comes now. He's he's going full frontal assault on me. And that's fine because what I want to do is I want to wear his numbers down and then come at him with those really good units. I'm actually going to send Hampton's Legion up and leave this green uh, recruit unit back instead. I'm going to do a little micromanaging here because... I want to be able to kind of go around with these guys and maybe do something with them in the little time that I have left. Now right, we got to get over and resupply. So numbers wise, it's going to start ticking more and more in my favor as this goes along. I've lost about 3,400 men. He's lost uh, 6,500. So we'll let these guys get up and around and see if they run into anything. Yeah, Gib Hacker, um, hoarding equipment. I, I've heard other people mention that. I've never really tried it before, but, you know, kind of buying things up even before you're ready to use them. Um, it's certainly something worth trying to see if it does re kind of replenish those things for you.
So you can see now some of these units that are assaulting are just suffering massive casualties on his side. So I'm going to get up now, and he's actually taken everything that was up here and just brought everything down here into one spot, which is really what I was hoping he would do. When you hold these, this area further north, he gets his, his cavalry, or not cavalry, his artillery up on this hill, and he's still got some that are firing down from up there, but not many. Oh, look at that. I ran into somebody, and he actually drove off one of my units. Because cavalry does not operate well in the woods. So I'm going to try to get past him and keep going. But I'll have to hold somebody up to kind of watch against that. Points in economy, buy all the 20 pounders and 24 pounders and have 20 brigades of them. My goodness, you think about the damage that that would do. That's awesome. The last battle of the Union campaign is Richmond. Oh, look at that. Surprise, surprise. He snuck one around on me. Not a big deal. I'm actually going to do this. Alright, so I did get two of my cavalry units passed with some casualties. I wasn't really paying attention to them and that and I suffered because of it. All right, so we're good there with one. So you can see now his front line units have suffered some major major casualties. Um I've lost almost 6,000 men. He's lost 11,000. So now we're going to press this. He's got a second unit down here, but he's not going to do anything with it. Make sure everybody's in supply. Now you can see just all the firepower along the line just tearing into him. Yeah, I wish that there was a little more freedom to do things like make an entire... Uh, core of artillery because there's certain things you can do with your perks on the generals to to do that but it it makes it hard to place the men the way you want them Vilkis uh, why they started a civil war for slavery it does seem useless but you have to uh, I'm not in any way shape or form defending slavery but it was um, it was a product of the fact that that was what drove the southern economy and it was um, it, it wasn't so much well I don't want to say it wasn't so much slavery but it really was about um, their economic ability um, I think if the south had it to do over again their best bet would have been to free the slaves and then fire on Fort Sumter they probably would have gotten uh, European intervention at that point But um, keep in mind, most of these guys that fought for the South, they weren't fighting for slaves. They felt they were fighting for their rights. They saw the North as a, um, and I'm, all I'm saying is how they saw it. They saw it as a war of Northern aggression, that the North invaded the South, uh, and that they felt it was their right to secede from the Union, and the North had no right to tell them they couldn't. 90% um, of the men in the Confederate Army did not own slaves. So it wasn't personally for them what they were fighting about, even if it was the overarching political 
reason for the war. Yeah, War of Raids, that's the name of the game, and that's that's how the Southerners saw it. A lot of them called it the War of Northern Aggression. And they saw no difference in their mind between fighting for their rights against what they saw as a tyrannical Union government. Uh, they saw themselves just like the, uh, the, the folks in the Revolutionary War. They saw in their minds no difference between King George III and Abraham Lincoln. And I'll be honest, I'm a big fan of Lincoln. I think he did some great things. I think he was a, a masterful politician. But the dude, there's a strong case to be made for him being tyrannical. I mean, he he didn't just bend the law. He outright broke the law multiple times and was really not shy about it. He did what he felt was necessary to win the war. And I'm not debating whether he was right or wrong. I'm just saying, you know, Abraham Lincoln was not a lily white character who did no wrong. He was willing to do whatever it took to win. All right, so now that we are inflicting significant casualties on him, we'll start driving forward, get up into these woods. Yeah, ignoring the Supreme Court, absolutely. Um, Grant uh, did own slaves briefly, I believe. Um, I mean, lots of Mary Todd Lincoln, the First Lady's family, owned slaves. I believe Sherman or someone in his family at one time may have also owned slaves. Lee actually... Um, gave a, uh, I believe it was in his will uh, for his slaves to be released or uh, the slaves he inherited or something. You know, it was, it was one of those things where, where I think Lee was very personally op opposed to the idea of slavery. Yeah, the, look at the battle. I mean, you see the effect the artillery has had in this battle. It's insane. And I just have to keep an eye on the time to make sure that I take the objective in time. Yeah, I knew that Lee had freed his slaves. Uh, no, this does not let me play long until I wipe them out. Uh, as I have been discovering lately, uh, and I know from kind of doing a playthrough on this one earlier, that the minute the timer runs out and the objective is not contested, this battle's over, unfortunately. I wish it would let me take it on further than that. All right, I got Hampton's Legion a little too far out there. Oh, yeah, Washington owned a bunch of slaves. Uh, so did Jefferson. And remember, I mean, until... Until the... Uh, until 1865, when the 13th Amendment was passed that abolished slavery, slavery was perfectly legal in the border states. Uh, in Maryland, in Kentucky... Even in places where, uh, in southern states, uh, where uh, the Union had control, those were the places um, where they actually freed them. Yeah, I haven't really been losing any commanders. That's That's been the nice thing about this so far. All right, I've got this issue with this artillery up here. So here's some of his supplies here. Yeah, I really wish this is one I could just kind of keep going for a while. The artillery on the hill uh, with the cavalry. I thought about that railroad, but the problem is um, they're in in the woods. They're not in the open, and because they're not in the open, uh, cavalry operates really poorly in the woods but these guys right here 
Actually, I'll go ahead and hit Colquitt, too. Did I vote for Trump or Clinton? Um, I, I intentionally stay far from politics uh, on this channel, but I will say this. I didn't want to vote for either one of them. How's that for an answer? And I think most Americans probably felt that way. Yeah, this would be a nice one to slaughter the enemy army, and that was kind of my goal here. However, I'm going to try desperately to go grab these supplies right here. I figured if I did the strategy where I held back, that I'd have an opportunity to inflict massive casualties on him. I don't think it's going to let me do that, but boy, did I just grab a bunch of supplies. Nice. Yeah, there were very few battles, uh, Gib Hacker, where artillery really was decisive in deciding the battle. I think this was probably one of them, historically. Um, this was a battle that was definitely, I think, uh, influenced heavily by artillery. All right, so I had 10,000 casualties. He had 21,000. I captured 1,000 men. Um, here's the good news. Number one, lots of supplies. Wow, I captured 3,000 Lorenzes. Those will actually come in really handy. Uh, grabbed a ton of supplies, captured five things of supplies. More importantly than that, um, not a single leader killed in that battle. I lost some that were wounded, but nobody killed. So, Yeah, forward. Uh, and, and guys, listen, I, I've said this before. Um, yes, this is Brigadier General Difficulty, Give Hacker. Uh, listen, I have as strong an opinion on politics as anybody that I know. Um, and I'm in the right forum for it. I'm very outspoken about those things. But um, there's no quicker way to turn off half your audience than to talk about your issues in politics. And, and there are well-intentioned, well-informed people who believe strongly on different sides of every issue. And I respect that completely. Uh, it's just not something I want to talk about on here. I don't mind talking about the politics of the 1860s, but present day politics I intentionally try to stay out of. That said, going to spend my money on politics right now, I think. Uh, well, you know what? I actually, I'm going to put one in army organization just because I want to get up to that 2,500 max yeah. brigades. Marlon, hey, I, I was worried you weren't here, my friend. I'm glad you're here. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at where things stand moving forward. We've got Kettle Run and Thoroughfare Gap. I, I try to take these in numerical order. Yeah, I mean, Gib Hacker, uh, on everything except Legendary, I do find it uh, fairly easy to win as a Confederates. Um, it gets tough as a Confederates in Legendary, but... Um, we're going to do Kettle Run. His his army here is 88 to 93,000 now. I want to take a look real quick and see uh, how much he has available to him. Yeah, uh, capturing the supplies, replenish the supplies you lost and money because right off the top, so say for example, um, I only take seven brigades into this battle. Say for example, I have, as I do, 35,000 supplies in my first core. Whatever I use of that gets replenished off the top out of the money that I have available or out of the supplies that I captured in this case. So um, I'm going to go ahead and I think I'll use my third core here just so I can start maybe leveling up. Um, I, I reluctantly put McClellan in command because he's a major general. And I'm going to just get him some experience here. Cold Harbor as the Union. Whoo! Boy, it's been a while since I played that one. So let's take a look here. Um, we're only taking seven brigades. So I think... What I'm going to do is I'm going to take take a few green troops as well as some experienced ones. Let's up to four. I can't remember this battle at all. 
Uh, what would have happened if McClellan had won the 1864 election? Um, McClellan, um, it's interesting because the only way McClellan would have won that election is if things had been going badly in 1864, at which point the North probably, by electing him, was indicating they wanted to sue for peace. Um, but I think McClellan personally, even though the Democratic platform was for one of peace, McClellan personally was pro-war. So I think he probably would have done his best to keep it going, but I think um, politically it would have been too hard for him to do that. Dixie was actually written by a northerner, I believe. Um, I think he may have been even in Ohio or from Ohio when he did that. So, um, you know, I, I just honestly don't remember this battle well enough to know which way to go with this. I'm going to at least take a little bit of cavalry just so I have it. I'm going to go veteran on those guys. Let's take a look and see what we can... Ooh, look at that. Uh, 4,000 Springfield 1855. Is that actually isn't a bad way to spend money, but look at those 20-pounder parrots. I've got to have those. I'm not going to use them quite yet, but they'll definitely come in handy later on in the, in the war. I don't think I'm going to take any artillery into this one, just because I'm limited to seven brigades. Alright, we gotta create another division. And I gotta do a little swapping here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a colonel there. Put a brigadier general right there. So I'm kinda going with a mix of green units and more experienced ones. A couple of more experienced ones. If Davis doesn't do the dumbest thing on the planet and remove Johnston with Hood, the South wins the war if it holds Atlanta and Petersburg. And you know, um, Petersburg, um, I was just reading today about uh, Winfield Scott Hancock and the missed opportunity that he had in Petersburg when there was an area that was pretty lightly defended and he could have taken it and, and maybe hastened the end of the war, but he didn't do that. And I'll have to look more into that and exactly where that was. Maybe one of you guys knows better than I do what part of the battlefield that was. But I'm going to go ahead and jack these guys all up to 2,500 and do my best to try and completely destroy his army here in this battle. Let's look at... Uh, oh, let's get some of these Lawrences. So it's going to be kind of expensive to do what I'm doing. All right, so I'm going to get everybody with some good weapons. No, oh, not those ones, though. That's too expensive. So we'll stop right there. Uh, let's go ahead and get some supplies here. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and dive in to... Kettle Run, with all seven brigades. Cold 1855s for the Cavs. Yeah, I was thinking about that. Vilkas, you, you taking off on us? Have a good night, sir. So we're going to outnumber him pretty heavily. He's only got 24 guns. I'm trying desperately to remember this battle. Okay, now that I see the map, I remember it's a really small small one. This is going to be an easy one to completely wipe him out with. Maybe I should have brought two units of cavalry into this one. So we're going to move fast and furious because I'm, I'm, I'm worried that it's going to run out of time on me and I'm not going to be able to completely wipe him out. All right, McClellan, don't be hesitant. If if this were truly McClellan, even though we outnumber him um, 16,000 to 10,000, he would have been wiring back to Washington that the uh, Confederates had 30,000 men in this battle. It's glitchy on the corner. Don't bump him up, bunch him up there. Okay. Yeah, there's occasionally I see that on a few different maps on this game where there's a glitch and and the units will just kind of go nuts. 
honestly what I want to do is get up on top of this hill and come down at him but I'll hold a couple units here too so let's go ahead and speed along what's happening Marlin, I appreciate that, sir. Um, there, there's been some discussion, uh, and some folks, some of you guys I know watch Colonel Kelly, uh, and he he doesn't have as many views on some of his as I do, but he's superb strategy wise. He's he's very good at the game. Um, my frustration with his series that he says is on legendary is that we never get to see anything in between, and some of the numbers that he has faced in some of those battles makes me really question whether it's really on legendary or not. But I will not question the man's strategy. He's, he's an excellent strategist at the game. Uh, so it's definitely worth checking him out to see another perspective on things. He doesn't do commentary, so you never hear his voice or anything. He just kind of um, types things on. And then you never kind of see, for the most part, the end screens. He just kind of puts the numbers up for you at the end. Uh, but there's still a great deal you can learn. I haven't taken the time to sit down and actually watch through some of his battles. But what I have seen, he does a very good job. Oh, look at him. Oh, that's because I'm still... I'm like, wow, how's that guy going so fast? I forgot I was still on uh, high speed. So we're already down to just an hour here. Yeah, my, uh, my great, 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 great grandfather was in the battles around Atlanta. It was actually his last battles because his three-year enlistment was up shortly after. And he uh, he was in the 20th Ohio, which participated in the March to the Sea, but he did not. Uh, he was actually, he was 55 years old. He had lied about his age to enlist. And he went home just before the March to the Sea. But he, he, was, he was at every battle, going all the way back to Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson. He was at Shiloh. Uh, he was at Vicksburg. All right. Any pages on the internet um, that you should look at uh, on the Civil War? Civil War Trust has some good stuff. Um, hmm, I'm trying to think of a, a good place to go. Uh, Civil War Trust, when I want a nice synopsis of a battle, Civil War Trust does a pretty good job with that. Alright, we got to press ahead here. I'm going to take this battery out. And I gotta get up here with my infantry real quick so I can cover them. Arch Warhammer. I'm gonna have to check that out. I have not seen his. Definitely something worth checking out. Alright, Dark Knights. Get out of there. Go, 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 go. So this is what I was afraid of about protecting them with infantry. Go, 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 please hurry. Wow, this is about to get ugly. All right, I'm gonna run Ferguson up there to protect them. I didn't wanna do this, but oh, there comes the, the volley. Yeah, they lost 100 men. That's why I should've had two units of cavalry. Using the steamroller in some battles, yeah, you know, especially in later battles as the Union, what I like to do is kind of, uh, I don't know how you'd describe it, but basically I'll line up waves, kind of like what the Union tried to do at Fredericksburg, very poorly, uh, and just hit him with wave after wave, knowing that the first couple of waves are going to break, and just do like a couple of lines of about four or five brigades, one after the other, just to punch a hole in his lines, instead of hitting the fortifications all along the line. All right, we're going to try to drive him over up here against the river. Really, really wish I had taken two units of cavalry now that I remember this battle. 
Would have been a lot easier to gobble up some of these units. Yeah, as soon as I get around this battery, I'm going to... Alright, let's slow Ferguson down. Alright, I'm going to come in here and, and finish off this battery now, and then I'm going to try to envelop him up here on the right. He's keeping his supplies out front, so I'm not going to be able to take him. Hey, there's Jubal Early. Um, little tidbit, little kind of fun fact about Jubal Early. When he was in at West Point, uh, a fellow classmate of his named Louis Armistead smashed a plate over his head. And Armistead ended up resigning from West Point over that incident. Some people suspect it was also because he had really bad grades, but... Um, but yeah, uh, I wonder how often Armistead and Early ran into each other after that and whether they ever spoke of that incident later in life. Armistead ended up uh, using other connections to get himself a, a uh, commission as a second lieutenant, uh, in, I think in like 1839, uh, so that he ended up being an officer in the Mexican War, despite not having graduated from West Point. Egan! Am I pronouncing that right, Egan? Egan! Hey, Egan, how you doing, buddy? How old is Egan? See if I can keep early from getting on that bridge. I'm going to bring Douglas up here. 13 years old. That is awesome. All right, I'll back up a little bit here. My uh, my daughter will be 13 in July. She's my oldest. I am not ready to have a teenager at all. All right, we've got 11 minutes. I'm hoping, 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 hoping he lets me continue this one. Was it Hancock who got on the commission? Okay. I know that Armistead Hancock and <laughs> Buddy Axe 7. Yeah, I, I understand that completely. Um, I know Hancock, Armistead, and uh, John Reynolds were all all buddies in the Mexican War together. Just one of many such connections across both sides during the war. And, yeah, it's just one of those really sad stories of the war, just knowing that whole story between Hancock and Armistead and how Armistead told. Hancock the last time they saw each other in California um, if I swear if I ever raise my hand against you may God strike me dead and then he is mortally wounded assaulting Hancock's position on July 3rd at Gettysburg and Hancock being severely wounded himself John Reber the, the cornfield trail I've never done that I, I have never spent more than a couple hours at Antietam at any one time I definitely want to really explore that battlefield more than I have. Um, I, it's one of my favorite battlefields. Uh, probably next to Gettysburg, it's my favorite one. I really enjoy uh, the Antietam battlefield and just the terrain of it and the way that it's all set up and how it's not commercial like Gettysburg is. The Dark Knight should get early. Yeah, you're right. I agree 100%. Uh, too late. <laughs> He has already surrendered. All right, we're going to have to wait until we're down to just one brigade before we can send the Dark Knights in. A heavy metal band telling the story of Gettysburg. Iced Earth Gettysburg. Interesting. All right. 
There needs to be more battles like this where you can just completely wipe him out. Especially on the Confederate side when I'm playing the Confederate campa campaign and I'm desperately trying to bring his numbers down. Yeah, we're going to kill these supplies, unfortunately. Alright, let's go get Lawton. I guess we're going to run into the other ones first. Interesting, Forno is the one that retired first, or re re uh, surrendered first. Let's move early. I'm a little nervous that one of these guys might break into the wrong place. Hey, let's uh, go grab these supplies. Maybe. Come on. All right, there's Trimble. I love the actor who plays Isaac Trimble in Gettysburg and Gods and Generals. He's fantastic. I have been to all three of those battlefields, John Reber, uh, but I was like 13 when I went to Bull Run Chancellorsville in Fredericksburg. I remember visiting the spot where Stonewall Jackson's arm was buried, and I remember reading a story about uh, how during World War I, I think it was, during some maneuvers in that area, that uh, an officer ordered his men to dig up the arm to prove it was really there. So, uh, all right. 1,000 casualties, 5,400 for him, plus another 4,000 missing, so actually 10,000. 10 to 1 casualties, I like that a lot. That's awesome. Grab some more supplies, grab some more weapons, and let's move right along to the next battle. So let's take a look at where things stand now. He's still at about 83 to 88K. Uh, thoroughfare Gap's going to be a, a larger battle. Yeah, got the ar entire army killed or captured. That was my goal. That will not be the last time that happens in this battle or in this campaign. Uh, so we're going to take 10 into this one. And uh, I believe I'm on the defensive in this one. So we're going to be facing at least 18,000 men, maybe more, depending on if he scales up at all. And I already forgot how many brigades it was. Is it 10? It's 10, I think. I do this a lot. 10 brigades. So we're going to keep McClellan uh, on this. Uh, uh, politics again. One more time, at least for now. Let's take a look here. Um, wow. Now we can get 4,000 Springfield 1855s. I think I'll spend that. We're continuing to get some experience points for some of these units. Going into our next major battle. All right, so, um, we're going to go ahead and give these guys some better weapons now. And we'll bring in some artillery for this one. Twenty pound parrots. And we'll bring the twenty four pounders as well. So how many is that? That's nine brigades. I'm gonna keep my cavalry there. All right, we don't have enough of any of these things to be able to do that, to upgrade those right now and keep them as melee cavalry. Yeah, forward, you're right. Yeah, this is all part of that second Manassas campaign. Yeah, Buford was forward. I agree. Buford was fantastic, especially at Gettysburg. And my goodness, is there anybody better to play a guy like John Buford than Sam Elliott in the movie Gettysburg? For me, he was my favorite casting job of that of that movie. I just there's nobody that epitomizes the tough soldier for me better than Sam Elliott. He's just fantastic in that role. So yeah, we're gonna take a look at the armory here in just a second. We're going to take one more unit here, and I think I'll go... Let me see what the numbers look like.
All right, so it's going to be pretty even odds. But I'm on the defensive, and I'm going to have some nice weapons, so that should work out in my favor. But I still I still think I want to take one more unit of, our, of uh, infantry just to be safe. Yeah. Okay. So this is what we'll go with. Uh, I have seen the ranch. I like it a lot. I haven't seen the latest uh, seasons. Oh, I was going to go to the armory before we did this. I did see the first season, though, and I really liked it. All right, armory. We're not going to use these farmers ever. So let's just sell those off. I may, 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 depending on the situation, use reboard. So I'm not going to sell those quite yet. I'm not going to be using these because I don't plan on doing any mounted infantry. I'll hold off on selling those for now. Uh, okay, here's the uh, the telescopic sites, those JF Browns. So I don't think I'm going to sell anything else. Let me take a look at what there is available to buy. Oh yeah, we're going to I'm going to buy up those 24 pounders and these 20 pounders. And there's lots of 10 pounders available too. So, um, And I think I will just so I have them. Go ahead and buy these. Man, they're expensive. But I've got the money. So just so I have a few things kind of extra there. All right, let's dig in. Thoroughfare Gap. Second Bull Run's probably the easiest major battle, um, grand battle as they call it on here, for the Union side. So I'm not too worried moving into that one. Alright, so let me just kind of remember how this goes here. Because it's been a while again since I did this battle. I mean, I'm guessing this is the ideal defensive position right here because you're at the edge of the woods you get open ground in front of you you got water that he has to cross it just seems to me that that's kind of ideal and i think i may go ahead and, and put a couple units up here with some artillery firing down on him so we'll take a look here let's get these guys moved up as far as they'll go I'm going to put the artillery up here for now at least. Okay. So we'll get right into position there. I really don't know where he's going to come from, but I assume it, that this is the way to go on this one. Georgia Railroad, yeah. Um, I've only played that one once because that's later in the war. So let's do this. Let's get some skirmishers down here. And out here. Just to be extra cautious. And give myself some more options. And I'll put these ones right here. They rarely hit your left, so load up on the right. So you mean up here? my right or on the right on the screen he, uh, three brigades up north to face me okay so so I should be fa I should be prepared for this side more than the other gotcha all right so let's do this I'll leave some skirmishers down here and shift more of my units that way 
I mean, that make, makes sense. If I'm him, that's the way I go too. Alright, so we'll have to hurry these guys up there. Yeah, okay, 2SP2. I knew there was a battle where that happened, and I couldn't remember if this was it, but there was something in the back of my mind making me think that this was the battle where that happened, where all of a sudden a unit appears out of nowhere on that side. Thank you for that reminder. I'll prepare for that. I'm going to cover uh, from anything getting around me on this side. That's why the skirmishers are out here. Flank the south to get at their guns. Well, that's what my dark knights are for. I'm still very sad that I don't have Bane in command of them anymore. I, I really need to check and see if there's a Bane available. So this guy's fallen right into a nice little trap here. He's in a tough uh, place terrain-wise, but he's also in a place where I got to open up on him with three brigades. So we'll take the Dark Knights out here into the open and see if maybe we can do some damage. He might be a lowly captain, you're right. So he's actually, he's sending, he's got one, two, three, four, five brigades down on the southern end right now. So poor Ferguson, who's already probably exhausted, I, I kind of need to send him back the other way. But I think Loomis will hold his own as long as he doesn't assault me. Alright, so I've lost, ooh, a whopping 124 men. He's lost about a thousand. Let's see if we can find his guns and his supplies. can't see very much so far. There's some of his guns. I don't know what else he has back here though, so I want to I want to go a little further behind him and see what's out there. Okay, Hampton's doing all right, but there's a lot of men coming that way. How will I recover from those losses? Yes. Yeah, I think we're gonna we're gonna plug Ferguson right in over here. Oh, all right. I guess this guy's all by himself back here. Not for long, sir. Yeah, here comes another brigade. I gotta I gotta get Ferguson down here.
Yeah, that's the Dark Knights. Uh, they should have a, a nickname. Basically, they're the they're the artillery killers. They're uh, doing real nicely for themselves in that department, even though they're being fired on by other artillery at the moment. Yeah, you know, the Canadian, there are several maps, as it was pointed out to me, and I've since kind of come to realize, that get used multiple times in the game. Or parts of maps. I know that that opening part of um, Chickamauga, ah, I can't get sucked into the woods. Because they lose their effectiveness, and now Dark Knights are going to break. It just baffles me how you can hit an ar artillery a battery out in the open like this and they can drag 750 cavalry men into the woods like that and now I have lost control over them All right, I gotta get out of this mess even though the supplies look nice and juicy too I gotta give these guys a chance to recover one of the units must have dissolved Probably some of his skirmishers. Alright. Let's do this. Oh, that's why the Dark Knights lost their commander. At least it wasn't Bane. I'm going to get these guys out of here and give them a chance to regroup. Twelve in a battery, that is what they say. They being folks who have researched such things. I've never been a hundred percent convinced of that, but I've gone ahead and begun to operate that way. Uh, with twelve being the uh, ideal number of units in a battery. I think his reinforcements are about to enter the field. I think I just saw that red bar move. Yep, here they come. Oh, they're not in the spot I thought they'd be. I was over a little too far. Jerk. Get over here and fight. He's going to hit my artillery. And then Hampton's going to turn and get flanked. Oh, boy. He just hit my 20-pounders. The space is now open for Bane. <laughs> oh, my poor 20-pounders. Oh. i to move these guys out so I can hit these guys. Uh, Hampton, stop turning. That guy just screwed up my whole battle plan. That's all I can say. get this all kind of resolved here briefly all right let's get down here and resupply these guys Alright, after that fun, things are kind of getting back to normal.
Yeah, you know when I very when I probably had maybe eighty hours in the game like you did, I, I did not use artillery much. If you go back and look at my very first videos back um, in like December twenty sixteen into January twenty seventeen when the game was still in early release and wasn't finished yet, you'll see that I I didn't make very good use of artillery either. Uh, that was something that kind of came with time and experience and other people saying that I was screwing up by not using artillery. It's, uh, it's a simple game in some ways and yet very complex in other games. I mean, I've got literally a couple thousand hours into the game yet and I still don't feel like by any means that I'm an expert. And I still learn things and, and figure out better ways to do things. And when you get up to like legendary mode, every little decision matters. Um, the way you spend your points, how many casualties you inflict, what kind of weapons you use, it all, it all matters. Where's my cavalry? A direct descendant of Robert E. Lee living in Australia. That's awesome. Very cool. I know he's got them out there. Uh, it's kind of cool. Sometimes I do this just because I, I'm I'm curious. Yeah, I don't I don't know if I want to send the cavalry up there. Um, sometimes I'm I just find myself curious about descendants of some of these people, and it's really cool to find out how many of them fought in the wars and things like that. Uh, like I think Nathan Bedford Forrest had a grandson who was a high-ranking officer that was killed in World War II, if I remember right. I know Stonewall Jackson's got descendants that are living. Abraham Lincoln does not. Um, his line died out, basically. Yeah, I bet there's a lot of direct descendants of Genghis Khan out there. Um, George S. Patton was a direct descendant of a Revolutionary War general. Hugh Mercer, who was a good friend and close uh, confidant of... Uh, of General Washington. Mercer was killed at the Battle of Princeton, I think. And of course, uh, Patton was also, you know, he's uh, he's also a grandson of a uh, regimental commander in the Confederate Army during the Civil War, and his uncle was killed in Pickett's Charge leading a uh, regiment. Louis Armistead's uncle was the commander of Fort McHenry in World War, or in the War of 1812, when the Star Spangled Banner was written. Um, for me, uh, I'm a direct descendant on both my mother and father's sides of Pocahontas, which is kind of cool. Uh, Daniel Boone's my uncle on both my mom and my dad's sides. Um, but probably my, my closest direct ancestor who was a prominent person in any kind of war or anything, um, King James IV of Scotland is a direct ancestor of mine. He was, he was killed, um, I think it was the Battle of Flodden Field, fighting against Henry VIII's men. My wife's a direct descendant of the guy who killed Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth. And of course, one of my ancestors killed Richard III's um, brother. His name was John Clifford. He, uh, he, had, he was nicknamed the Butcher. And he was the one that killed the Earl of Rutland. He's actually portrayed in some of Shakespeare's plays. Clifford is. I think I'm just going to keep my cavalry safely in the rear. Unless I can grab these supplies. John Hooper, signed their Declaration of Independence. Very cool. Yeah, I had a couple of ancestors at uh, the Battle of Kings Mountain also. One of them, Benjamin Greer, claimed, uh, his descendants anyway, claimed that he was the one who fired the shot that killed the British uh, militia commander there. Though I've read other things that say it was someone else. A uh, really cool ancestor of mine was a guy by the name of Edmund Wally, W-H-A-L-L-E-Y. He was one of the regicides who signed the the death warrant for King Charles of England. And then he fled to the United States, and there's this whole kind of story about 
how he hid in a cave, and I guess it's real famous over in Connecticut where that happened. I had uh, an ancestor named Thomas Blossom who was one of the pilgrims. Uh, he was on the other ship, the Mayflower. There were actually two ships, the Mayflower and the Speedwell. And the Speedwell sprung a leak two different times, and they had to, to turn around and eventually leave it behind. And so Thomas Blossom stayed behind and came over later. He's actually also an ancestor of both Presidents George W. Bush and also Barack Obama, making them distant cousins of mine. All right, we'll see if it lets us continue this one. The cave, yes. Uh, Ray Rard, yeah, that's, I knew it was in Connecticut somewhere. But uh, I, I knew there was something, you know, some kind of historical monument there or marker or something about all that with Edmund Wally. Connecticut is one of the eight states that I have never been to, uh, sadly. I have a very short list that, uh, that I haven't been to yet. Uh, yeah, we're going to keep this one going a little while. Regicides Trail. Yeah, Regicide, that's why, is because he was one of what they called the Regicides, the people who signed the king's death warrant. And then when the monarchy was restored after Oliver Crom Cromwell died, it uh, became imperative for those people to flee. Yeah, you guys are right talking about that. That's why I love tracing my family history so much because I love finding those connections to moments of history. Uh, like discovering that my one ancestor, his name was um, George Bartrug. Uh, that was the anglicized pronunciation. That he was a French soldier who came over with Lafayette to fight in the American Revolutionary War. Uh, and all of that was in his Revolutionary War pension file uh, when he settled in Ohio after the war so that was really cool to find out and my daughter being a huge fan of the Broadway show Hamilton thought that was really neat too because Lafayette's one of the characters in that show yeah uh, Connecticut is a hard one to miss especially since I've been to Massachusetts New York uh, New Hampshire and Vermont but I haven't been to Maine and I haven't been to Connecticut uh, it's just the nature of my travels and how that all kind of worked out. My wife's ancestor was a guy by the name of David Gardiner, and he was the very first white child born in the state of Connecticut. Uh, Gardiner's Island, which is the big island off the eastern coast of Long Island, New York, uh, is named for his family. Lion Gardiner is my wife's ancestor. And... Um, if you ever read the story about John Tyler... Uh, he was president of the United States back in the 1840s. He has two living grandchildren. Um, and one of them, I believe his name, uh, his middle name is Gardner in honor of that because John Tyler's second wife was a direct descendant of Lion Gardner. Uh, no, I didn't drive at all. Um, when I've been in New York City, uh, we drove through New Jersey, coming from Ohio through Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Uh, and when I was in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Vermont, I actually flew there. Uh, for my job, so I uh, didn't go through Connecticut. All right, we're going to play this out a little bit longer here and then move on. He's only got 7,000 men left on the battlefield. New Mexico is beautiful. Yeah, I would love forward to uh, to visit the battlefields of World War One in Europe. I tell you what, I, I I've been spending a lot of time studying World War One recently, um, and my goodness, I mean some of those battles, just things like Verdun and the Somme. I just I, I can't even wrap my mind around must, what it must have been like for those men. The next time I think about Pickett's Charge and how crazy it was for 15,000 men to assault over that mile of open ground. I'm going to think about the Somme and what those British soldiers did and realize that Pickett's Charge really wasn't all that big a deal.
I do have, uh, I also have some Swedish ancestors. Uh, a lot of people, if you have family uh, ancestry in, in Pennsylvania, uh, there's a good chance you have Swedish ancestry, and I do. Um, in fact, they called, ooh, John Bell Hood just surrendered. In fact, they called that area around uh, what became Philadelphia. It was originally called New Sweden. Yeah, I mean, I agree when you're talking about the Civil War and slavery. To to say the Civil War was just over slavery is to vastly oversimplify the, comp the complex nature of the politics uh, of everything leading up to that point. All right, just for the sake of time, I'm going to wrap this one up. So, nice day for me. 3,000 casualties, 11,000 for him, plus another 831 missing. Grabbed a few more supplies. I did lose two colonels killed in that battle. So, we're going to go ahead and get refit and ready for... Uh, we're going to wrap up with the uh, second battle of Bull Run here. Ah, uh, boy. Let's see. I'm going to start putting a few points here and there into medicine. So let's go ahead and take a look here. Honestly, it doesn't matter all that much <laughs> how many men he has. But, uh, and there's always this first phase of the battle where there's not much going on anyway. So we're going to go ahead and get ready to go here. First things first, we got to get some new commanders in place. And let's go ahead and take a look before I get too far. Boy, I'm so glad they didn't lose one more man. I mean, I know all this is done randomly, so I should not necessarily expect to find. But I know some of the names get used over and over again, so I'm really hoping I could find Bane. But no Bane thus far. Maybe he'll show up some point later on. We'll go ahead and get a lieutenant colonel there. Let's start loading everybody back up in the first corps as much as I can. And I'm going to move some of the artillery out. Yeah, boo, no Bane. Sorry. I'm just going to go up to 2,000 for now on some of these. I don't want to lower their experience too much. Well, some of these units lost a ton of men. At Malvern Hill. I honestly don't need all that many men to do this, but I'm going to move some of these bigger units back into the first core and move some of the smaller ones out just to make it a little easier. Died in Finland fighting the Soviet invasion. Wow. That's very cool. I was uh, talking to somebody who uh, is a follower on this channel who uh, I think he I think he said his great-grandfather was a, a higher up in the SS during World War II. And uh, I don't know if you're still in here, but uh, he uh, his, his great-grandfather had fled to Argentina after the war like a lot of the uh, the Nazis had. And hey, I mean, you know, listen, I, you can't control who your ancestors were, so um, I would find that fascinating, e even without having to necessarily be proud of who that person was, but still a fascinating history. We actually had a guy uh, in my church, uh, some kids in my youth group, who uh, their grandfather had been in the, in the German army during World War II. He was actually Croatian. He had been conscripted when, um, when the war broke out. And had fought fought in the German army, but then came to the U.S. after the war. And a lot of people don't know that Hitler's family, uh, what was left of it, came to the United States even before the war. And uh, I think one of his nephews actually tried to enlist in the Allied cause. 
they changed their last name from Hitler to something else. And I think they lived in New York. Two AP Hills. Nice. All right. So history guy is now a major general, finally. We've got Grant, history guy, and McClellan as our core commanders. I'm not going to spend an awful long time do, dealing with all of this just for the sake of time. Um, I'm down to lieutenant colonels here, so I'm not going to make these units too big, these new ones. Tell you what, let's go ahead and pick up John. Oh, we're going to get Hancock. There we go. And I'm going to go ahead and give Hancock a division. A bit of Prussian royalty. Very cool. Not German, please. Prussian. <laughs> All right, so I hadn't done a lot of this, so I, I mean, I've got a lot of making up to do on some of these units to get them back up to strength. I'm trying to move this along as quick as I can. Those poor 20-pounders, they took a hit. Thankfully, I bought more. Some of these units, they're not even going to get used in this battle. Because this one's going to be over so fast. All right. Paul Newman on your mom's, mom's side. Very cool. Yeah, another 20-pound battery. Not a bad idea. Um, artillery. I've got enough for the 24-pounders, uh, too. All right, there we go. And I'll have to get some better commanders so I can get the stars up on those things. But uh, I've still got 33,000 men and a ton of money available to me here. So we're just going to have to um, make the best use of it. I'm going to go ahead and get Reynolds because I need more commanders. I don't have any extra colonels that I can swap out and grab that other... Uh, here we can. Yes, sir. Because I'm not using this fourth division, at least not yet. All right. Only Union general can compete was Hancock, uh, and <laughs> not the Butcher Grant. Now Grant was a. Uh, he was a good strategist, I think. He was a terrible tactician. Well, I wouldn't say he's a terrible tactician. I just don't think he was anything special as a tactician. We're just going to max these guys out because I've got the manpower and the money to do it. And they're all relatively inexpensive because they're fairly new units. Hancock, I don't think he ever fully recovered from his wound at Gettysburg. And uh, he ended up kind of stepping out of field command in 1864. But then he was, uh, not everybody knows this, I'm sure some of you guys do, but uh, he was basically in, in charge of the uh, the whole trial with the Lincoln conspirators, and he was the one that kind of oversaw that execution. Uh, 
it was called Second Bull Run by the Union, Second Manassas by the Confederates. As a general rule, not always the case, but as a general rule, the Union named armies and battles after bodies of water. The Confederates named armies after states and battles after the nearest town, typically, uh, or the nearest landmark. So, um, rare exceptions would be Vicksburg, which they all called Vicksburg. Gettysburg was called Gettysburg by everybody, but Antietam was a creek, so it was named that by the Union. It was called Sharpsburg by the South because that was the town where it was fought. Um, does my wife know I give the boys Pop-Tarts at night? Yeah, and she probably does it too. <laughs> In fact, sometimes my wife eats Pop-Tarts at night. All right, so I'm not going to... I don't think I'm going to build up my army fully from there. I think that's going to be more than enough to handle this job. This is not a battle where I'm going to be fighting it out for a long period of time. It's a battle where I'm just going to overwhelm him and take the objective. So we're just going to dive into this thing. All right, here's that first little phase of the battle that I just kind of throw away when I'm on the Confederate side, but you don't get to do that on the Union, so we'll fight it out. Sherman was an excellent commander. I, uh, For me, as far as the, the high command in the Union side, Sherman, I think, was one of the best. Sherman was uh, every bit as aggressive as Grant. But the difference for Sherman was he didn't face the, the competition, so to speak, that Grant did. So it's, it's hard to truly evaluate Sherman when you recognize that he never really went up against anybody that was a, a formidable opponent. I mean, Johnston. Johnston was a decent... I don't think Johnston was as bad as some people think he was. He certainly wasn't Hood. No, I don't think Lee was overrated. There's a reason that the um, that Abraham Lincoln wanted him to take command of the Union Army at the beginning of the war, even though he was only a colonel. Lee was o Lee wasn't overrated, but Lee, uh, I think, overestimated either his own ability or the ability of his men at times. Or maybe trusted his subordinates too much later in the war. I don't know. I mean, you got to remember, too, Lee wasn't a young guy. He wasn't old, but he wasn't young either. He, he wasn't a young guy, and I think he had some serious health problems by the time you get to 1863. Let's drive these guys out of Bronner's farm here. Speed this one along. Stop. We don't want melee attack. There's a Stonewall Brigade. Louisiana Brigade. Yeah, forward, that's what I was thinking of, was the heart attack at, uh, around the time of Gettysburg.
Thomas. Thomas is a really interesting character. He's a Virginian who stayed loyal to the Union. And, of course, he uh, held when no one else did and became the Rock of Chickamauga. It could be. Uh, the heart attack may have had something to do with, with why he didn't listen to Longstreet and why and all that. Part of me also thinks that um, I know it was probably a fictional statement, the scene you see in the movie Gettysburg where where Lee says to Longstreet, he, uh, he talks about uh, there's that great scene where he says, to be a great soldier, you need to love the army. To be a great commander, you need to be willing to order the death of the thing that you love. And then he goes on to say, he says, we are adrift here in a sea of blood and I want it to end. I want this to be the final battle. And I think that was part of Lee's thinking. I think he wanted so badly for that war to end and to be done with it all that he got super over aggressive and overconfident at Gettysburg. And he just rushed those men in there hoping that would be the end of it. So I've got a nice, nice big advantage here, even without fully fully stocking up my troops I gotta remember how I did this I mean I know what I do is I I come around this flank and I hit him and that's how I win the battle because all you gotta do is take this objective here to win the battle I'm just trying to remember kind of in detail exactly how I went about it first thing though I know I'm gonna do is I'm gonna swap out artillery for more infantry But we've got a long, long time before he gets all his reinforcements from Longstreet's Corps. Yeah, forward. Yeah, yeah. Um, compared to football, he was trying to score that final touchdown to end the game and did whatever it took no matter the cost. Yeah, see, that's what I think it was. I think he just, he wanted it to be over. And I don't blame him. And if you look at where the war went from there it just was was a complete bloodbath moving forward after gettysburg it had been at that point too i mean if you look at the casualties in previous wars and then you start to look at what happened starting in 1862 in the civil war it was just obscene i'm going to shift everybody over this way as best i can with without being in range of his guns Hey, uh, Stream, uh, Akis, I think I'm pronouncing that right. You have a good one too, man. Thanks for sticking around. Thanks for being a part of this. This one's actually a really easy battle to win if I do this the way I did it before. Uh, I did it with, I think, the last time I fought this on Brigadier General difficulty, I think I, I did it with like 2,500 casualties. But being that I'm kind of half paying attention to that and half paying attention to you guys, I don't expect it will go quite that easy this time. But it will be over fast. I had, uh, you're talking about the Overland Campaign, 1864. I recently discovered that my great-great-great-grandfather's brother um, was in, I th gosh, I, it was a P Pennsylvania regiment. Uh, it was a Pennsylvania regiment that just suffered massive casualties at the wilderness. And um, I found out that he had broken a leg when um, a wagon had fallen over on him late in 1863 and because of that he was in a field hospital and he came back to the regiment three days after the wilderness battle was fought 
and so he just missed out on the on the the battle where I think something like 150 men in his regiment were killed. It was just massive numbers of killed on top of the however many were wounded as well. Um, and it was just amazing to me that he just barely missed out on that uh, that horrible battle. So we're going to get everybody shifted over here and just completely overload on his his left flank or his right flank. Yep, Blitzkrieg straight for the objective. Meadowhawk, what's up, my friend? Good to see you. That is absolutely the plan here. It's Blitzkrieg all the way. Just getting everybody into position. I'll hold enough units here just to keep his attention a little bit. But we're going to punch right through over here. And he doesn't get any reinforcements until later on. So I should be fine. I didn't even really need to bring any supplies into this one. Shift a couple more, just a little bit over further before I go. Yeah, I, I I can't imagine not only to have fought in World War One um, at places like Verdun and the Somme, and and one of the places I I really want to go is to the uh, the ossuary um, at Fort Douaumont in France. I think it's in France um, where the the casualties of the Verdun battle are, and you just see all those bones, and uh, oh my gosh, just just trying to wrap my mind around what it must have been like for those guys in those trenches. Uh, I, I'm, I'm listening to this book on, on audio, on audible. Um, and just the, the sheer, the volume of artillery shells that were poured into these tiny areas, uh, just thousands upon thousands of shells dropping in like a little square kilometer or so, uh, every day. And just even without necessarily being, directly involved in a firefight oh my gosh the uh just the mental state of those soldiers must have been something that's why they they started calling it shell shock during that war and then these huge you know battles where there'd be 60 70 80 thousand casualties in a day I want to swing around a little further here. Might have been a good place for cavalry. The book that I'm listening to, um, here, let me pull out my phone for you, because I do a lot of traveling, so. Um, it's excellent. It's very well done. A World Undone, the story of the Great War. It's like 68 chapters. It's like something like 26 hours long to listen to the whole thing, but it's, it's really well done. And it gives a lot of the background of the war and a lot of the context of things and uh, really, really good. Charging Marie's Heights every battle. Yeah, pretty much. With massive artillery barrages first. The creeping barrage, as they called it. Where they would kind of have the artillery leading the, the troops as they assaulted. Which was supposed to happen at the Somme, but didn't work out the way it was supposed to.
Yeah, Longstreet lived into to the early 1900s. Um, Adelbert Ames, who was a Civil War general, he was Joshua Chamberlain's commanding officer in the 20th Maine. Um, I think he lived in 1933. I think Joe Wheeler was another Confederate general who lived a long time. I always find it really fascinating that Joseph Johnston was one of the honorary pallbearers at um, General Sherman's funeral and uh, took off his hat despite the weather and was warned about that. And he said, well, if it were he who were standing here in my position, he'd take his hat off too. And then Johnston died not long after that. All right, we got to push this. Well, it's going to get interesting because, of course, the next series of battles leads us up to Fredericksburg. Which is always an interesting one on the Union side. That's awesome. Just my opinion. Yeah, that's why I want to get back into uh, War of Rights. When I did it early on, and I wasn't even really kind of involved in anything organized. After that, I got involved in some regimental fights and stuff, and it was really cool. Yeah, I, I, I'm very much... Looking forward to getting back into that. And gosh, yeah, I mean, uh, think about this. There were men who fought in the Civil War who were alive when we dropped the atomic bombs in, in uh, Japan. Wrap your mind around that difference in technology a little bit. And so many men, I mean, there were men who fought in the Indian Wars who saw the moon landing. I mean, just crazy to think about some of those things. Sometimes we don't think about how different eras of, of history overlap. You know, thinking about Woodrow Wilson being president during World War One of the United States, and he was alive during the Civil War. He, uh, he remembered, I think it was him, remembered seeing Jefferson Davis ride past as he fled from Richmond. And uh, Teddy Roosevelt watched Abraham Lincoln's funeral pass by in New York City from a window. Hey, that's really cool. You played in the, uh, events to create footage for the trailer. That's awesome. Love it. That, that had to have been a lot of fun. The first Texas, that's awesome. Very cool. Fubar, yes. <laughs> Effed up beyond all recognition. Alright, this is the only tricky part here is when you get up here to the objective itself and Stonewall Jackson does not want to give it up easily. And I left my general and my supplies back here. And I haven't even used any of these other troops, but I really don't need them. And there's no point in kind of putting them in harm's way unnecessarily. But we'll go ahead and start moving them forward a little bit now. The slaughter of the rebels goes on, yes. I completely wiped him out in the last battle. And now we're just doing our little blitzkrieg on the uh, on the objective to win a, a swift victory at second bull run. And honestly, not, not necessarily this aggressive, but if Pope had been just a little more aggressive than he was, he probably could have won this battle too. And it's funny because Pope talked a big game when he came out east to take command of the Army of Virginia. And it kind of rubbed his staff officers the wrong way when he came out and said, Well, I, came, I come from the west 
where we actually win battles. We see the backs of our enemies. And then he promptly got his tail kicked in at second bull run. An expensive reloading simulator. <laughs> War of Rights. It's fun. It's it's fun because it, it's the first game that really gives you a little bit of a sense of what it was like to have been a soldier in the Civil War. Obviously the scale's not there yet. But you definitely feel what it's like if you're, you're by yourself. You really want to have those... 10 or 12 guys next to you firing in a line together or or two or 300 guys next to you. All right, there's the objective. So as soon as this one's over, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this uh, wrap this up. And yeah, I agree. Um, the way to go with that game is to get involved in a regiment and, and kind of immerse yourself in all of that. That's where the fun really is. Um, I'm gonna wrap this live stream up with the conclusion of this battle, which should be coming in just a couple minutes. As I mentioned at the start, for those of you who were not here, um, most likely will not be a live stream next weekend. Uh, we are getting our keys for our new home this week, Friday morning at the latest, so we're very likely going to be moving all day Saturday. Um, if that changes for some reason, I'll certainly post a video during the week to let you guys know that. But otherwise, um, it'll likely be the following weekend, and I will be coming to you from my new office and my new home. I'm excited about that. And uh, for those of you who celebrate as I do Easter, I want to wish all you guys a very happy Easter. Um, and I just uh, hope you have a wonderful time with uh, your family and those you may celebrate with. For the rest of you, enjoy your time off that you may have uh, if you get some time off work. If you're here in the States, when you get that holiday. And yes, uh, yeah, moving, yeah. My wife and I have both said, now obviously life may get in the way of this, but we have both said we're going to die in this new house. We have no intention of ever moving again. So, uh, woo. I hope that's the way it goes down. It's a beautiful house. We're very, very excited, very glad that we're in a position to do that. Uh, here comes some of the enemy reinforcements, but too late to do anything about it. We're just going to cover this just in case here. Oh, that was me that got reinforcements, huh? Don't need them. So we'll finish this out. I'm just going to let him quietly slip away. War, uh, or you guys were talking about um, Scourge of War. Yeah, I have that. I have all the games for Scourge of War. Um, what I don't have is experience playing it enough to where I can feel comfortable doing videos yet, but I very much want to get into that. It's a lot of fun to play. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bendoski, for that. Uh, congratulations. appreciate that very much. So there we have it. 3,400 casualties on my side, 5,200 for him. A very bloodless second bull run. But that sets us up nicely to go into Fredericksburg. So I'm, I'm now up to almost 40,000 men in my force uh, pool here. $543,000. Man, it's great to be on the Union side. I tell you what. Uh, and I also just have like 50,000 men already sitting here. So uh, going to be interesting. Uh, we'll see how this goes when we get into Antietam. South. Oh, I forgot. I'm thinking ahead to Fredericksburg. We haven't fought Antietam yet. So Antietam's one I really hope I can crush him at. So we'll see how that goes. But as of now, yeah, bloodless, he says. Yeah, I mean, that's basically the, the entire battle casualties of the entire American Revolutionary War uh, in that battle, <laughs> uh, at least the number of dead. So, um, hey, have a great, uh, great weekend, everybody. Uh, thanks once again for being a part of this. I really appreciate it. Um, love having these chats with you guys. Love experiencing this with you. Uh, I hope you enjoy it half as much as I do. So thanks for watching. And uh, we will check, check in on you again real soon as I'm able to. Have a great weekend, guys.